So let's talk about server redundancy, server high availability. Regardless of whether you're a small, medium or large businesses, uh, most companies will need to have all of their IT operations running at least eight hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day, seven days, 365 days a year, depending on what sort of services you are running. So making sure that you've got the right high availability and redundancy configured into all of your infrastructure is extremely important. You can break these out into two main categories, physical servers and virtual servers. If we're talking about physical servers, every physical server that is purchased, as I mentioned, look at pairing it with two physical servers. If you have a physical server that is gonna be running Windows or Linux, whatever its function may be, if it's going to be a database server, if it's going to be a uh, web server, look at commissioning two. If one fails, the other one can pick it up. So these are things like um, setting up your service perhaps in tandem, setting them up with uh, load balancing in place so that the load can be spread across two, high availability in place so that if one of those servers does go down, all of the operations can fail over to the other one. So if you are purchasing a server and it has a number of hard drives in it, look at purchasing a server that has sufficient hard drives so you can set up multiple levels of RAID, right? So RAID 5, RAID 1, 0, different sorts of RAID configurations that if one disk fails, you don't lose data. So you've got to configure your server based on um, you know, multiple groups of RAID disks. Look at having hot swappables and cold swappable disks available. So you may have an array of disks. For example, you may have eight disks which are set up in a RAID, perhaps two four group disks uh, in RAID 5, so two RAID 5s in, um, you know, made up of four disks, and you may have an additional one or two disks in there, which are your hot spares. They are disks that are there. In the event that a disk fails in one of your RAIDs, the other disks can be allocated to that RAID, rebuild the RAID so that you don't lose any data or you actually contain, uh, you continue to have your redundancy in place. Additionally to your hot spares, you may want to look at having cold spares available. They could be disks that are sitting in there dormant. They could be disks that are sitting in a cabinet or in your server room, in your cabinet, just sitting outside of your server so that in the event of a disk failure, even if your hot spares have gone, somebody could physically go to that server and insert new disks and then have those disks rebuild as they need it. It's always important to have some spare disks. The last thing that you want is for your disks to fail uh, multiple disks to fail and then you have to go and order and procure more disks. So having some disks that are cold spares essentially um, allocated, you know, predetermined for that particular server, always available is always a good thing to do. Your network card. Get two network cards with multiple ports on each of those NICs, right? So that if one physical network card fails, the other network card can pick up the slack and you can still be on the network regardless of if it fails or not. If a physical port or a cable gets disconnected from a physical port on that uh, on one of those NICs, you can still be operational if that NIC has more than one port. So nowadays you can purchase network cards with two, four um, you know, physical network points and configuring, essentially configuring more NICs, more network points across multiple NICs will ensure that you do have high availability. Depending on how you are, you know, how you are setting up your network, if you have multiple VLANs, multiple subnets, have every VLAN, every subnet having at least two network, two network points physically on each NIC. Configuring dual power supplies on each server is one of those elementary things. So if you are you know, if you are purchasing, procuring a new server, get two power supplies. Most uh, rack-based servers, you know, most rack-based servers, even tower servers, will contain dual power supplies. But make sure that whenever you are looking at configuring your servers, they have two. If one fails, the other one will pick it up. The other important thing is there's no point in having two dual power, you know, two power supplies for dual power if they're both running into the same power supply, into the same UPS, into the same power rail in a rack, for example, because if that rack goes down or that power board goes down or that UPS goes down, you've lost both of them. So if you do have two power supplies on a server, have one running into one rail, into one UPS, have one running into, a, into another rail or another UPS, so that if one fails, you've got the other one that can still pick up 
and you can still have uh, your server running. I think that is very, very important is to make sure that all of your servers are always under warranty. The last thing that you want is for your server to be out of warranty, to be end of life, or to not even be under support with whatever that manufacturer, with, with, you know, with whatever the vendor is, whether it be Dell, Lenovo, HP, uh, Cisco. Um, if you don't have that server under warranty, under support, and you have failed parts, right? If you have failed parts, you potentially either lost, you know, functionality to a component of the server, or the server could be down. Um, if you don't have any support, or that server is not under warranty, it's going to be very difficult for you to get those spare parts. So making sure that you do have your server under support and have a good support agreement in place, perhaps with a very quick turnaround time, four hour turnaround time, eight hour turnaround time, 24 hour turnaround time, whatever your SLA may be, so that if you do have parts that do fail, you can go to your vendor, you can go down to a particular vendor that you know gives you the procurement for your parts and you can get those parts as quickly as possible. The last thing you want especially is your server to be out of warranty and end of life even, which is worst case scenario, where you may not even be, be able to get the right parts for your server and then you're gonna be in big trouble if you do require replacement parts for your server. Then once you've installed the operating system, whatever the function of that server is, make sure that the function, the software, the application has redundancy considered, right? Always have redundancy at the back of your mind when you are setting up your server. That could be clustering, for example. So if you are setting up your server, as a SQL server, for example. You may wanna have clustering configured so that if one server goes down, the services of that one server can be pushed or failed over to another server. If you're running virtualization, if you have, for example, something like uh, VMware, you've got ESXi configured on one of those servers, have clustering in mind. So you have one set up with ESXi, you have a secondary server set up with ESXi, both in a cluster, set up with failover, so that if one server fails the, in the cluster, the other one can pick up the, uh, the functionality of that um, failed server if it needs to get uh, operational. But always set up your servers in pairs. We talked about looking at buying two of everything. So even though you've got a physical server with multiple levels of redundancy on the hardware perspective, on the server, disks, on the network cards, on the power, et cetera, et cetera, make sure that your configuration of your servers is always across two servers. One fails, the full server fails, the other one can pick up the slack accordingly. In a VMware perspective, in a virtualization, in a hypervisor perspective, you can set up multiple levels of redundancy from high availability to failover across that server. Imperative that you do that, always have that planned and perfected um, as you are configuring those servers. Configuring uh, a, your hypervisor, uh, we're gonna be using VMware as an example. Um, the VMs that are getting built, Again, similar to the physical server perspective, or you could be, you know, you, you build it in pairs. It's always good practice to do that as well in a in a virtual perspective. Um, there is a lot of human error and things can go wrong from a VM perspective. So always set up your VMs in pairs as well. Um, if you have a web server, build two web servers um, so that you know if one fails, the other one can pick it up. We talked about SQL, for example. Um, there's other things like DFS um, for you know for file-based uh, replication between sites, uh, between servers, excuse me. So if one fails, the other one can pick it up or you can have load balancing across your VMs. Um, have your VMs set up with multiple NICs, right? So a physical server has a network card and has physical ports on the NIC. Um, have a VM set up with multiple NICs as well. Um, one going to one physical server, one going to a different physical server, one going to a physical network card, one going to a different network card. Uh, have your VMs talking to different uh, data stores, which is essentially a group of disks uh, configured on a SAN or a NAS or a storage device somewhere on your network. And you have that configured with multiple data stores and connect those multiple data stores or disk pools to your uh, VM so that you can have, you know, not all, essentially not putting all of your disks in the one basket. So if one data store goes down or one NAS goes down or one SAN LUN goes down, um, you can, you've got redundancy on a disk level as well. So we've mentioned multiple, um, uh, you know, if you've got SQL, uh, multiple data, you know, multiple servers with clustering from a VM perspective, multiple hypervisors for redundancy in a cluster, uh, Think about you know, your core infrastructure such as your domain controllers, 
your DNS, always very important to have multiple domain controllers on your network. Regardless of your size of your network, your domain controller is used for all of your authentication. Your staff log in, they get authenticated on your network, the computers get authenticated on your network. Your DNS is doing your translation of your IPs to DNS form. Um, so having multiple domain controllers, multiple DNS, ensures that if one of them is affected, the other one can pick it up and carry on. So when you're configuring your DHCP server and it's pushing out your IP addresses, you have multiple DNSs to talk to multiple domain controllers. If your primary is unavailable, your secondary can pick it up and it can continue as normal. This is my overview of your server redundancy. There are other things that we haven't talked about from a server perspective, but making sure that any component on a physical server, on a virtual server, always think about that redundancy, always think about that high availability so that if one of the devices, one of the components fails, the other one can pick it up. So very, very important that you do that. I hope you found this video helpful. I really hope that you did learn something, that it was something useful that you can put uh, into practice and give you some tips when you are designing your IT in your business. Um, love it if you commented, give me a thumbs up and uh, we'll talk to you next time. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel, Digital by Computing, just on the button there for more videos.